313-778-7600 is the call-in number if you have a question or comment. You listen to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. The Superstation, Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotep. It is Tuesday, March 8th, 2022, and we are live. Okay, so a few days ago, I posted a, um, I follow Morris Day, of Morris Day and the Time, Minneapolis Sound, remember Morris Day from uh, being with Prince and remember uh, Purple Rain. Um, I saw uh, a, a post that Morris Day did on social media. It was on his Facebook page. I follow, I follow Morris Day and the Time on Facebook. And he said that the Prince estate, so we know Prince passed away a few years ago. He said the Prince estate is legally barring Morris Day from using the um, stage name or, or um, performing under Morris Day and the time. Okay, so I, the first news I got about this was from uh, Morris Day and the Times uh, Facebook page. And I read the Facebook post also. And then over the past few days, some stories have come out, some articles have come out about this. Uh, Variety.com has a good article. Morris Day slams Princess Estate, says he's forbidden from performing as the time. Okay. And uh, Morris Day said they are forbidding him to perform as Morris Day in the time. And Morris Day is his real name. So we're going to talk a little bit about this. There are two articles from um, Variety.com dealing with this. This is this is really strange for this to come up. Uh, Morris Day, frontman of the Prince uh, Spawned of, of the Prince uh, Spawned group. Let me see if we can go back to this here. Uh, what happened here? Okay, so so the, the, the second article is uh, what's behind the legal standoff between Princess Estate and Morris Day and the Time. Okay, so we'll, we'll talk about this as well uh, today. Morris Day, frontman of Prince Bond funk group The Time for more than 40 years, has laid into his late benefactor's estate, which he claims has told him he can no longer work under the name Morris Day and the Time. But Morris Day is his real name. So we'll talk about this. Then there was a uh, was a study that came out today dealing with lead uh, exposure. Okay, uh, lead exposure, especially in gasoline. Uh, Associated Press has a story about this, and not a lot of other newsletters have, have picked this up. Half of U.S. adults exposed to lead levels as kids. Half of U.S. adults were exposed to lead levels as children. And it talks about how this causes this exposure to lead level has caused a reduction in people's IQ scores. OK. Uh, over 170 million U.S. born people. And so if we look at this piece here from Associated Press, uh, blackamericaweb.com has a story on this also. But um, half of U.S. adults exposed to harmful level lead levels as kids. OK, over 170 million U.S. born people who were adults in 2015 were exposed to harmful levels of lead as children. A new study estimates over now there's only 330 million people in the U.S. So you're talking about basically half over 170 million U.S. born uh, people who were adults in 2015 were exposed to harmful levels of lead as children, a new study estimates. 
researchers use blood lead level, census, and leaded gasoline consumption. Blood lead level, census, and leaded gasoline consumption data to examine how widespread early childhood lead exposure was in the United States between 1940, this is before w World War II started, between 1940 and 2015. We're gonna talk about this on today's show because we know that it was in Flint, Michigan, which is only about 30, 35 minutes or so away from Detroit. It was in Flint, Michigan, um, 30, 40, 35, 45 minutes away from Detroit, where you had the um, uh, Flint water crisis with the uh, uh, water, water being poisoned by lead that was leaching from the lead pipes in some people's homes who had lead pipes. Only about 50 percent of the homes in uh, Flint, Michigan had lead pipes. So we'll talk about that as well. Now, there was a uh, on our Sunday show, you know, we talked about this story uh, dealing with a, a group of African-American attorneys that are putting putting uh, together in a petition uh, to the United Nations. OK, and this deals with the um, this deals with the plight of African students in uh, Ukraine. So one of those attorneys was interviewed on um, the Black News Channel, okay? And we're gonna talk about that also. Uh, so we talked about this article on Sunday, Global Group of Black Attorneys File UN Complaint for African Refugees. All right, and we know Benjamin Crump is one of those, uh, one of those lead attorneys that's um, involved in this, okay? So we talked about this story on Sunday. We have an update to that as well. All right, calling numbers 313-778-7600. 313-778-7600 is the call-in number. You listen to the African History Network show. I'm Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. All right, stand by, everybody. Stand by. Share this broadcasting on social media platforms. Stand by. from breaking four minutes stand by okay who still needs to register for the online class i teach on saturdays and sundays ancient kemet the moors and the ma'afa understanding the transatlantic slave trade where they didn't teach you in school and uh, from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement of Black Power, 1865 to 1968. All right, stand by. Stand by, everybody.
Yeah, so you control the radius of a man or woman's thoughts. You control the compass of his or her actions because the mind can't do or teach what it doesn't know. We have it all on 910 AM Superstation. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 910 AM Superstation, the future radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotep. It is Tuesday, uh, March 8th, 2022. And we are live calling numbers 313 778 7600. 313 778-7600 is the call in number if you have a question or comment. Okay, so um, I, I saw um, a post that Morris Day did uh, a few days ago, and I shared this on uh, my personal page, Michael M. Hotep on Facebook, and uh, I shared this also on uh, our Facebook fan page, The African History Network, The African History Network. And follow us on our, our fan page, The African History Network. Turn on live notifications so you know when we go live also. And I was shocked to um, see this Facebook post. But Morris Day is saying that the estate of Prince is forbidding him from performing as Morris Day in the time. Uh, Morris Day, frontman of Prince Spawned Funk Group, The Time, for more than 40 years, has laid into his late benefactor's estate, which he claims has told him he can no longer uh, work under the name Morris Day in the time. He can no longer work under the name Morris Day in the time. He said, I've been, he said, I've given 40 years of my life building up a name and legacy that Prince and I came up with. That Prince and I came up with. He wrote in a social media post. He said, a name that while he was alive, he had no problem with me using. I literally put my blood, sweat, and tears into bringing value to that name in fact booked me on several tours and many jam-packed uh nights at paisley park under the name morris day and the time not once ever saying to me that i couldn't use the uh the name configuration now they have the uh original uh, social media post in here. I think I think it's in this one. Uh, okay, this is right here. So this is the original social media post. So if you follow me on Facebook, you know, I posted this a few days ago. I shared it. Uh, so uh, Morris Day uh, posted this on Facebook. He said, I've been I've given 40 years of my life building up a name and legacy that Prince and I came up with, a name that while he was alive, he had no problem with me using. I literally put my blood, sweat, and tears into bringing, uh, that, bringing value to that name. In fact, he booked me on several tours and many jam-packed, uh, on several tours and many jam-packed um, nights at Paisley Park under the name Morris Day in the Time. Not once, once ever saying to me that I couldn't use that name configuration. However, now that Prince is no longer with us, suddenly the people who control his multi-million dollar eight want to rewrite history by taking my name away from me, thus impacting how I feed my family. So as of now, per the Prince estate, I can no longer use Morris Day and the time in any capacity. So he posted this on Instagram and on his Facebook page. Okay. And when I first saw this, I was like, well, I, I had to I had to read it a few times and check his account. I know I follow him. I'm just like, is this a joke? Okay. So um, if we go back and look at this article, and there's a follow-up article from March 7th. This one is from March 3rd. There's a follow-up article from March 7th. Um, now, a rep for Prince's estate told Variety.com on Thursday 
uh, and this would have been uh, last week, Thursday. This would have been uh, Thursday, March 3rd. Given Prince's longstanding history with Morris Day and what the estate thought were amicable decisions, the Prince estate was surprised and disappointed to see his Reese post. The estate is open to working proactively with Morris Day to resolve this matter. However, the information that he shared is not entirely accurate, they stated. However, a letter from an attorney representing Prince's estate addressed to Morris Day's attorney, Richard Jefferson, dated December 13th, 2021, and provided to Variety.com, does indeed state that Morris Day, quote, has no right to use, register the name, the time, in any form. Okay. Can, can they call it the clock? Can they call it Morris Day in the clock? <laughs> I mean, I'm just I'm just trying to say, okay, Morris Day in the time. What do they call it Morris Day in the clock? What do they call it Morris Day in the watch? Is that okay? Uh, what what do they call it Morris Day Morris Day in hang time? It, it, quote has no right. Morris Day has no right to use or register the name, the time in any form, end quote, which presumably includes concerts and recordings. And I've been to a Morris Day in the Time concert. They put on a hell of a concert. I'm telling you, those boys, they put on, and, and when I when I went to go see them, this was like, this was, this was um, 15, 20 years. This, no, this was, uh, this was 20 years ago. This is like 20 years ago when I went to go see them because and Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis were performing with them also. I saw them here in Detroit. They put on a hell of a concert. Um, any references? Uh, uh, okay, so has no right to use or register the name, the time, in any form, which presumably includes concerts and recordings and references a 1982 contract in which Morris Day quote, acknowledge, acknowledge that PRN Music Corporation, an entity which at the time was wholly owned by Prince, is the sole and exclusive owner of all rights in and to the time. Is the sole and exclusive owner of all rights in, in and to, quote, unquote, the time. Now, the current dispute stems from an attempt by Morris Day to register the name Morris Day in the time, a rep for Morris Day confirms to Variety. Because I was wondering, okay, where did all this come from? How, 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 how did all this stuff just pop up? Okay, so understandably, Morris Day tries who made this name. And then Mor Morris Day, I mean, um, if you, there was an unsung episode on Morris Day. On TV one unsung, watch that. Because Morris Day hit rock bottom. He he was addicted to drugs and hit rock bottom. He had to go live. I can't remember if his sisters. He was living, he had to end up living with his sister or, or one of his relatives. He had to move in with them and then he had to get his life back together. Um, uh, so he he fell on hard times. The letter does propose that the matter be settled amicably and the estate licensed the name uh to morris day quote rather than file a petition to cancel the estate re rather rather than file a petition to cancel the estate would prefer to discuss this matter with you and resolve it through an agreement that recognizes the estate's rights in the trademark the time and licenses morris day uh, use the trademark Morris Day in the time with with the services identified in the existing trademark registration and goods related to such services, such as musical sound recordings and musical video recordings, such as musical sound recordings and musical video recordings 
um, it states, presumably further exchanges ensued without resolution. Okay. Now the estate is currently the estate of currently in transition from Comerica Bank being the trustee to a combination of three of Prince's six heirs, three of Prince's six heirs who are represented by attorney L. Londell McMillan and Primary Wave Music, which acquired the interest of his three other heirs. However, the transition is not yet complete. In a statement to Variety Magazine, a rep for Primary Wave said, quote, Comerica is the trustee and personal representative for the Prince estate. Primary Wave does not currently have any say in the affairs of the estate while it remains in probate. We have reached out to Comerica to let them know that we do not agree with their decision and believe they should do the right thing here. We have reached out to Comerica to let them know we do not agree with their decision and believe they should do the right thing here, which is to let Morris Day continue to use the name Morris Day has primary waves full support, end quote. Okay, so read, read the rest of this article. We'll talk about this on the other side of the break. Uh, there's another piece from Variety that deals with what's behind the legal standoff between Prince's estate and Morris Day in the time. We'll talk, uh, talk a little bit about that. Uh, when we come back from the break and then also we'll deal with uh, the petition by some uh, uh, black, uh, some black attorneys, some global black attorneys uh, to file a complaint with the United Nations dealing with the mistreatment of, of uh, African students in Ukraine. And then also we'll talk about the uh, study that came out today that deals with uh, how half of the U.S adults were exposed to harmful lead levels as children over one over 170 million u.s born adults were exposed to harmful levels of lead as children a new study estimates you listen to the african history network show on michael m hotel we'll be back in a few minutes stand by all right stand by Okay, share this broadcasting on social media platforms back from breaking four minutes. If you like this type of information, you can support the African History Network. Dial a sign the AHN show through Cash App. Dial sign the AHN show through Cash App. Also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. Stand by. Stand by, everybody. Back from breaking three minutes.
All right, stand by, everybody. The Superstation, Detroit's only African American talk radio. Welcome back to the African History Network show, right here on the antenna on the Superstation, the Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotep. It is Tuesday, March 8th, 2022, and we are live. Okay, uh, right before the break, I w- we were talking about this story that I found out about a few days ago. I think it was March 3rd that I may have first posted about this. I shared the post that uh, Morris Day did uh, on his Facebook page. And this deals with uh, the story of Variety.com is a good uh, article about this. Um, Morris Day slams Prince's, Prince's estate, says he is forbidden from performing as the time. Okay, so we know Moore's Day and the Time had songs like The Walk and Cool and 777-9311 and Jungle Love, uh, Gigolos Get Lonely Too, all that. I think I still have some more. I had I had the time on um, LP, 33 and the third. I don't know what happened to it. I think I still have the time on cassette tape somewhere or something like that. But uh, we know... Uh, Morris Day in the Times also in the Purple Rain movie as well, 1984, Purple Rain, Purple Rain. So there's another article from um, v- Variety as well, a follow-up article. And this one here is from, uh, I want to go to this one here. This is from March 7th. The, sec- the second piece is... Uh, what's behind the legal standoff between Prince's estate and Morris Day in the Time? What's behind the legal standoff between Prince's estate and Morris Day in the Time? Now, a- a- as Prince's estate slowly digs uh, itself out of uh, the legal and procedural uh, Morris that uh that ensued after the legendary musician died in 2016 without leaving a will, a standoff between Prince's estate and Morris Day, Prince's near lifelong friend and collaborator and frontman of the first Prince spawned artist uh, broke into the open this week. At issue is Morris Day's use of the name The Time, which an attorney for the state claims it owns the rights to citing a 1982 contract between Morris Day and Prince. Morris Day, who says his rights to use the name were never questioned by Prince himself over the many intervening years, blasted the estate on social media last week. A rep shared the attorney's letter, which proposes that uh, Morris Day licensed the name, presumably for a fee. Uh, the matter is doubly complicated by the fact that the state is currently in transition from Comerica Bank being the trustee to a combination of three of Prince's six heirs who are represented by attorney L. Londell McMillan and Primary Wave Music, which acquired the interests of his three other heirs. However, the transition is not yet complete and both Primary Wave and McMillan have spoken out against the estate's stance, saying they will side with Morris Day when the time comes. No pun intended. All right, right. so check this out also from Variety.com from March 7th, 2022. So hopefully they can rectify this, because I don't know what they're going to, Morris Day and Time will call themselves, Morris Day in the clock or... Morris Day in the Watch, or I mean, it's always it's always been Morris Day in the Time. Actually, in Morris Day, uh, okay, on his Instagram page, he posted um, referencing coming to America, uh, 
<laughs> said his mama called him clay <laughs> his mama named him clay so i'm gonna call him clay all right so i mean he's like look come on it's more day in the time everybody knows this all right <laughs> all right let's go to the next story so uh we've covered this we've talked about uh the plight of african students in ukraine we know this is the uh 13th day of the russian invasion of ukraine and we, we uh on our sunday show uh we dealt with this uh group of uh black global uh attorneys who are going to petition the uh, united nations on behalf of african refugees okay they talked about this on uh, the Black News Channel. Uh, I think this was uh, yesterday, March 7th. But this piece here from uh, NBC News. A global group of black attorneys filed a UN complaint for African refugees. The group of lawyers, which includes Benjamin Crump, will send the complaint to two agencies uh, within the United Nations. An alliance of prominent civil rights lawyers from around the world on Wednesday, la uh, last week, Wednesday, because this article came out March 4th. So that was uh, that was when that it was Wednesday, March 2nd, a prominent group of uh, a, a prominent group of civil rights lawyers from around the world announced it will file an appeal to the United Nations on behalf of black refugees facing discrimination while trying to flee Ukraine. The group includes um, the group includes Benjamin Crump, uh, the civil rights attorney for the families of George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, uh, attorney Jasmine Rand, who represented the families of Trayvon Martin and Michael Brown, uh, Peter Herbert, one of one of Britain's few non-white judges, Peter Herbert, Jamaican Member of Parliament G. Anthony Hilton, British Solicitor Jacqueline McKenzie, and Carlos Moore, uh, President of the National Bar Association uh, in the United States. They plan to file the appeal to the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights, as well as the UN's Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. Carlos Moore spoke uh, to uh, the Black News Channel on uh, Monday. And let's go to uh, that clip, uh, Shakita. It's clip number two. This may be the worst type of discrimination being turned away as you flee a war zone because of the color of your skin. Now, a group of well-known civil rights lawyers plans to press the United Nations to do something about that. And, and joining us right now is one of those lawyers that is pressing that issue. He is Judge Carlos Moore, and he signed the appeal. He is also the president of the National Bar Association. And, and, and Carlos, for those who are unfamiliar with what is going on at the Ukrainian border, Judge, if you would, what is happening to black refugees as they're trying to flee that war zone? For lack of better words, they're being placed at the back of the bus or the back of the train. They have been forcefully taken off trains uh, for the benefit of, of white uh, refugees. White women and children are being uh, valued more than uh, than black women and children. We have several Nigerian uh, students there studying medicine and other things, and they have reported that they have been forcefully manhandled off of the trains and buses out of there. Judge Moore, as I pointed out, you signed on as the president of the, the National Bar Association. Um, how did this alliance between civil rights lawyer, lawyers come about, it, and how did you get involved? Benjamin Crump and Jasmine Rand are the two lead um, signers, and so Jasmine
I had a Ukrainian uh, representative hey, on, Shakita, and he too was outraged favor. by what Shakita, he saw. Back, but, that up for about a, back that up about a minute, because I had to refresh the screen here. It's uh, acting up. This restream was acting up. So back that clip up about a minute or so, please. All right, thanks. So this is uh, Judge Carlos Moore, who is the uh, national president of the National Bar Association, and he's explaining the uh, petition that the uh, this group of uh, black attorneys is going to file with the United Nations. Okay, let's go back to the clip, please. Several Nigerian and uh, students there studying medicine and other things, and they have reported that they have been forcibly manhandled off of the trains and buses out of there. Judge Moore, as I pointed out, you signed on as the president of the, the National Bar Association. Um, how did this alliance between civil rights lawyer, lawyers come about, and how did you get involved? Benjamin Crump and Jasmine Rand are the two lead um, signers, and so Jasmine reached out to me as president of the National Bar Association, and once I was apprised of the what was going on, and several of my members had reached out to me before Jasmine about what was going on uh, in Ukraine, uh, we immediately said yes, and that we stand against injustice anywhere because it's a threat to justice everywhere, as Dr. King said. Judge, uh, I had a Ukrainian uh, representative on, and he too was outraged by what he saw, but what has been the response so far from what you're seeing on your end of the appeal? The United Nations uh, condemns the acts of uh, those in charge of Ukraine and Poland and discriminating, and they are supporting our appeal. And so we are continuing to collect evidence uh, from those that have experienced racism. And uh, we're going to call out to continue to cry what's going on. We're simply asking for equity. Uh, Black Lives Matter, African uh, diaspora lives matter across the world and so we simply right. call for fairness. Pause right there, We're coming up on everyone break. wants to get out of Ukraine safely and blacks should be getting just pause right there. Just back it up about a minute or so. We'll we'll continue this on the other side of the break. Listen to the African History Network show right here on 910 M Superstation the Future Radio. I'm your host brother Michael M Hotep. We'll be back in a few minutes. Stand by All right, you can still you can still register for the online class I teach on Saturdays and Sundays. Um, on Sundays is ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Maafa. Understanding the transatlantic slave trade, where they didn't teach you in school. We deal with thousands of years of history and what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. Just posted the link there. The class is on sale. Um, Classes on sale $60, regularly $130. Okay, back from breaking four minutes. All right, stand by. Back from breaking one minute.
Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. The Superstation of Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotel. All right. Uh, be sure to visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. You can register for the uh, 10-week online classes I teach dealing with history. Uh, on Saturdays, it is Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, what they didn't teach you in school. We deal with thousands of years of history and what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. So this class is, um, we do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived and recorded. You can go back and watch it anytime. This class is on sale, $60, regularly $130. Even after the class is over with, you uh, can still watch the class. So even a year from now, you can go back and watch the full class. Visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. And as soon as you register, you can watch uh, the classes we did. Uh, this past weekend okay and then we have a um, bundle pack where you can uh, get both courses that i teach because on sundays i teach from the civil war to the civil rights movement the black power 1865 to 1968 uh the bundle packs on sale a hundred dollars regularly 130 dollars uh, really 260 dollars it's a 260 dollar value on sale for 100 dollars uh if you've taken any of my online classes with me in the past email me at ahn show at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AHN show at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, and you'll get a 50% discount. Okay, I want to go back to uh, the story we were dealing with, uh, this group of uh, Black attorneys that are filing a uh, petition with uh, the United Nations on behalf of African refugees. Just Carlos Moore spoke with uh, the Black News Channel's Dale Waters on March 7th, 2022. Let's go back to this clip, Shakita. And they are supporting our appeal. And so we are continuing to collect evidence uh, from those that have experienced racism. And uh, we're going to call out to continue to cry what's going on. We're simply asking for equity. Uh, Black Lives Matter. African uh, diaspora lives matter across the world. And so we simply call it for fairness. It's, it's despicable. Everyone wants to get out of Ukraine safely. And Blacks should be given a chance to get out just as quick as the whites. What do you hope ultimately comes about uh, of what you're trying to do? Because many of those who are trying to flee might have already left the country and, and um, have gone and, and tried to find other avenues. But what is the message you want the United Nations to send to black people who are still trying to flee Ukraine but find themselves being stuck at the borders? The message we want is to uh, call the global alarm. I have been um, impressed by Nigeria. They sent a president of Nigeria in a plane over there to get to his people. They didn't wait on people to do right. They got their own people out of there. And so to the extent, uh, time is very precious and we're just simply uh, raising the global alarm. And then on the back end, we will decry this in the United Nations and try to prevent it from happening in the future. Judge Carlos Moore is the president of the National Bar Association. Judge, as always, thanks for being with us this morning. Okay, so that was from March 7th, 2022, Black News Channel. Check that out at their uh, YouTube channel, BNC on YouTube. Okay, um, I want to go to this next story here quickly. Uh, Shakita, we're going to go to uh, that clip from ABC Channel 7. Uh, so cue that up. We're going to that here in just a second. Okay, dealing with uh, the lead uh, in the water. All right, so the, um, I saw this uh, story today. Uh, Associated Press has this story. A lot of news outlets have picked this up. Uh, Black America Web, and I looked at a number of different news outlets and uh, local outlets as well. ABC Channel 13, ABC Channel 7 out of Chicago. Um, half of U.S. adults exposed to harmful lead levels as kids. All right. This is from March 7th, actually March 7th, 2022. But a lot of them uh, started reporting this uh, today. So uh, over 170 million U.S. born uh, people who were adults in 2015 were exposed to harmful levels of lead as children, a new study estimates. Researchers used blood level, uh, used blood lead level census and leaded gasoline consumption data to examine how widespread early childhood lead exposure was in the United States between 1940, the year before you, the, the, the year before the U.S. got involved in World War II, between 1940 and 2015. In a paper published 
in the proceedings of the uh, National Academy of Sciences on Monday, they estimated that half the U.S. adult population in 2015 had been exposed to lead levels surpassing five micrograms per deciliter. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, uh, threshold for harmful lead exposure at the time. Let's go to this clip, uh, Shakita from ABC Channel 7. New study finds an entire generation has been impacted poisoning. Researchers found nearly everyone born between 1961 and 1980 was exposed to dangerous levels of lead. That's about 170 million people in the U.S. with high levels of lead in their blood during their childhood. The impact led to an estimated loss of a collective 800 million IQ points. The study found Lead gasoline, which uh, leaded gasoline, um, which was commonly used in the 60s and 70s, was actually the blame team, the blame here. Okay, so the scientists from thanks, Shakita. The scientists from Florida State University and Duke University also found that 90 percent of children uh, born in the U.S. between 1915 and, and 1981 have blood lead levels higher than the CDC threshold, have blood lead, lead levels higher than the CDC threshold. And the researchers found, found significant impact on cognitive development. On average, uh, early childhood exposure to lead resulted in a 2.6 point drop in IQ, okay? That's average. So some people, the drop in IQ was higher than that. Um, on average, Childhood, early childhood exposure to lead resulted in a 2.6 point drop in IQ. The researchers only examined lead exposure caused by leaded gasoline, the dominant form of exposure from the 1940s to the, light, to the late 1980s, according to data from the U.S. Geological Survey. Leaded gasoline for on-road vehicles was phased out starting in the 1970s, then finally banned in 1996. Okay, read the rest of this uh, uh, piece here from the Associated Press. Half of U.S. adults exposed to harmful lead levels as kids. Uh, so this is why, you know, regulations and laws and policies and environmental justice is important. All right, if you like this type of information, you can support the African History Network, dollar sign, the AHN Show through Cash App, dollar sign, the AHN Show through Cash App, also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN Show. We have six days a week. This helps us keep doing the research, stay on the air, keep broadcasting, pay some of the bills, etc. You can also visit our website, africanhistorynetwork.com. We have the information there. Uh, and we have the link to our Cash App account. Uh, and this is our official cash app account. When you go to it, it says Michael dollar sign the AHN show. And it shows my picture there. These other ones are fake African history network cash app accounts. Be sure to register for the online classes I teach on Saturdays and Sundays, ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what it didn't teach you in school. And from the civil war to the civil rights movement and black power, 1865 to 1968, I teach these 2 PM to 4 PM Eastern standard time. We do the sessions live. The sessions are archived and recorded. You can go back and watch them anytime. As soon as you register, you can, uh, this content, you, the classes, you can start watching. All right, look, we have to get out of here. Remember, right now, it's correct your own behavior. It's not over till we win. We're kind of forever. And we'll talk to you tomorrow. Peace. All right. Let me disconnect that call. Okay, how's everybody doing? Uh, who still needs to register for these online classes? Uh, then we have people watching on Facebook and YouTube. So the class is on sale right now. Regularly $130 are on sale, $60. We have the bundle pack. You get both classes for $80. Uh, you get both classes for $100. Um, if you have taken any of my online classes in the past, you'll get 50% uh, off uh, on the courses. So you, you'll get the bundle pack for um, you get the bundle pack for $50. Okay, which is a $260 value. And I'm going to post the link here again. And as soon as you register, you can start watching content and you start watching the classes. So I do a PowerPoint presentation. We have book references, articles, video clips, 
it's a ton of information we go through um this history chronologically we deal with ancient kemet ancient africa the now valley region of africa we deal with the uh numerous archaeological discoveries that um numerous archaeological discoveries as well that have come out in the, in the, in the past 10 15 years or so um we deal with uh, some information from Dr. David M. Hotep's book, The First Americans Were Africans, Documented Evidence. A lot of you all have seen interviews I've done with him um, over the past few years as well. You can also use this information with your children. I would say the content is PG-13. Okay, I would say the content is uh, PG-13. It's not overly graphic. I don't do a lot of cursing or things like that. Uh, let me see here. So, so, uh, uh over 50 articles that we reference in the class and it's over 200 slides. Um, and so the class is very visual. We have video clips, uh, all, all types of uh, different learning aids in, in the class. Uh, and this is Dr. David M. Hotep, who wrote The First Americans Were Africans, Documented Evidence. His book came out in 2011. It's backed up by 713 footnotes. His book fairly documents an African presence in North, Central, and South America. South America dating back at least 56,000 years ago. In uh, North America, in the territory we call South Carolina and Georgia, uh, dating back uh, about 51,700 years ago. Page uh, 14 of his book deals with the discovery by Dr. Albert Goodyear in Allendale, in, in uh, Allendale County, South Carolina in 2004, where they discovered 13 different types of evidence thoroughly documenting an African presence in the land we call the United States of America, dating back at least 51,700 years ago. They found artifacts, architecture, campsites, carvings. Uh, footprints in lava, genetic M174D haploid groups dealing with DNA and genetics. They found linguistics, paintings, skulls, skeleton structures, and tools. They found 13 different types of evidence thoroughly documenting an African presence uh, in the land we call the United States of America, dating back at least 51,700 years ago. This is before Native Americans came into existence. This is a picture of Dr. Albert Goodyear. This article is from ScienceDaily.com, November 18, 2004, that deals with this discovery. New evidence puts man in North America 50,000 years ago. So these Africans that they found evidence of, these, these were the Khoisan. The Khoisan have the oldest DNA on the planet. They go all around the world. They're the ancestors to the Ainu and the Twa. They're the short statured Africans. A, 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 uh, an October 2012 genetic study published in Science Magazine found that the, that the Khoisan in Southern Africa are the oldest ethnic group of modern humans with their ancestral line originating about 100,000 years ago. The Khoisan formerly uh, called by the derogatory term Bushmen are genetically unique and no other currently known population had separated so early from our common modern human ancestor, according to the report. The Khoisan live mainly in Southern Africa in territory spanning Botswana, Namibia, Angola, Zambia, Zimbabwe, and South Africa. They are largely divided into two groups, hunters and gatherers, the Sans people, and the keepers of the livestock, the Khoi Khoi. The Khoisan uh, the Khoisan languages include the distinctive click sounds that aren't found in the languages of their neighbors. Uh, AtlantaBlackStar.com has a, a good article, Five Ethnic Groups That Prove the First Humans Were Black. So this is just, uh, so when we go throughout history, we look at different archaeological discoveries like the discovery on the Greek island of Crete back in 2010 that shows a, uh, African presence dating back at least 130,000 years ago. 
They found stone tools on the Greek island of Crete that date back at least 130,000 years. Crete has been an island for more than 5 million years. And they said that um, this uh, seems to push back um, Mediterranean voyaging back more than 100,000 years, specialists in Stone Age archaeology say. This is an article from the New York Times from February 15th. 2010 on Crete, new evidence of very ancient mariners. So with all these archaeological discoveries that keep coming out, and they found more than 2,000 stone artifacts, including hand axes, on the Greek island, island of Crete over the course of two summers, okay? These uh, numerous archaeological discoveries that, that are coming out in different uh, different parts of Africa, in, 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 uh, especially some coming out of Egypt, um, we look at the one coming out of Morocco in June of 2017 that uh, was uh, had uh, skeletal remains of Homo sapiens that date back 300,000 to 350,000 years ago. We look at the lost city of Egypt, Tanis Heraklion, uh, that was revealed in 2013. This was a, a, a city that was swallowed into the sea and, and was built around 8th century B.C., Thomas Heraklion. We look at the uh, ancient beer factory that dates back about 5,000 years ago that was discovered in Egypt in uh, 2021. And, and we, we see all of this, um, these civilizations and these artifacts, things like this. These are much older than what we've been told that they are. Okay. All this stuff is much older than what we've been told that, that it is. All right. So um, some of the things that we uh, deal with in the, in the first class that I teach ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. We look at this history chronologically. Uh, and then we look at, uh, uh ancient African history, uh, ancient Nubia, Ta-Nehisi, uh, Abyssinia, Ethiopia. Uh, we look at ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt. Uh, we look at, you know, Ghana, Songhai, Mali, Zimbabwe, Carthage, um, all, uh, all different types of uh, different civilizations. And then we look at uh, the 800 year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors. And uh, we look at what leads to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. We look at some of those early African saints like St. Saint Nicholas. We know a lot of your early saints, Christian saints were Africans. St. Nicholas was African who uh, Santa Claus is based upon. And, and we know that uh, father, we know that center class uh, uh, who was uh, celebrated amongst the uh, amongst the Dutch. OK, center class in the, in the Netherlands and in Holland, we know center class is a religious figure. And when the Dutch come to the U.S. in the early 1700s, they introduce center class and he becomes the mythological figure of Santa Claus. Center class is uh, Dutch for St. Nicholas. And we know about center class as Joie de Piet and the uh, celebration that the Dutch have of, uh, of Joie de Piet, Black Pete, who was a Moor. And uh, the, uh, in uh, November, December, they, they have this parade and they celebrate, uh, they, they reenact uh, Joie de Piet and center class coming uh, into the Netherlands on a steamboat from Spain, okay? And we know that the Moors going into Spain in 711 AD. There's a good article from the Washington Post that deals with this. Um, we can pull this up quickly here, dealing with center class. This one right here from the Washington Post, center class and joie de Piet. Why a holiday has me talking to my kids about blackface because these Europeans have this parade where they dress up in blackface and they put on Afro wigs and uh, red lipstick and uh, hoop earrings, especially gold hoop earrings, and they imitate, they imitate the Moors. So here they are here reenacting on this boat you see uh, the you, you see the Europeans dressed up as Joie de Piet, Black Pete, Black Pete, who was a Moor in the mythology introduced into a children's book in 1850. And you see center class. OK, and they're coming 
into the Netherlands. All right. And uh, in this article here by uh, Tracy Brown Hamilton, she talks about having to teach her children about racism. OK. And, and each year there's more and more protests against this celebration that's been taking place for decades. Uh, and people are calling it racist and racially insensitive, things like this. Right. But when you go through and look at this history, this is connected to, to the history of the Moors in, in Europe. Uh, and it says in the, tra the, the, tra the tradition is on the second Saturday of November, Jean de Piet, Black Pete, arrives in the Netherlands on a steamboat from Spain. Okay? Arrives in the Netherlands on a steamboat from Spain, along with center class, a towering, thin, and plushly dressed figure. Hundreds of people gather to watch the steamboat arrive. The Piet's dancing and waving while brass band music plays until center class disembarks on a white horse with the Piet's walking at his side to greet and offer treats to the children. The ritual repeats in various cities across the Netherlands until December 5th, the name day of St. Nicholas, the name day of St. Nicholas. Now, Joan de Piet is, according to folklore, an assistant to center class and of Moorish descent. He's a, he's a, he's a, now some, in some versions of the stories, they say he was a slave to center class. And, and he, it, now, whether he's a slave or a servant, Keep in mind, the Moors conquer a lot of Europe. So whether he's a slave or a servant, it's it, it, uh, this is symbolic of the Moors being conquered and 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 center class now being a servant and, and now Joao de Piet being a servant to center class when it was the when it was the Moors who civilized Europe and 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 taught many Europeans how to bathe and introduced the periodic tables and um taught many europeans how to read because about 85 90 percent of europeans were illiterate when the moors go in in eighth century a.d so joan de piet according to folklore is an assistant to center class and of moors descent traditionally since uh traditionally since piet's first appearance joan de piet's first appearance in a children's book in 1850 so they encode the racism into a children's book and condition them to the dehumanization and subjugation of African people by putting the messages into children's books. Now, Joata Piet is portrayed as a very dark skinned character with very large red lips. Why, why does he have to have large red lips? With very large red lips, with large red lips, curly black hair, and giant hoop earrings. And a lot of Moors, when you study history, wore hoop earrings, even Moorish men, especially gold hoop earrings. And um, they, they wore, they, 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 when you look at this, and I've been studying these celebrations of Joao de Piet going back to probably 2012. They wear, they put on Afro wigs. These white people put on Afro wigs and blackface to imitate African people. When Piets appear in person, they are portrayed by volunteers in blackface. Unlike Santa Claus, who comes one night a year, center class and Piet stick around for a few weeks, leaving presents for children in shoes left out by the fireplace each night. A nightly news program called Center Class Journal covers the adventures and hijinks of scent and his servants and makes the experience both magical and believable for our children. But, but we are also inundated with news of protests and riots among those in favor of the Joie de Piet tradition and those who wish to see it end. And discourse between Dutch politicians and international bodies such as the United Nations Committee on the elimination of racial discrimination, which urged the Netherlands 
to put an end to racial stereotypes and blackface is less joyful. As a parent, I want my children to participate in local customs, to enjoy them with innocence and wonder, but I also want them to be sensitive to others and obviously not racist. Okay, so read the rest of this, but this ties this ties into the Moors from Spain in the Netherlands, and that, because they were the, the Moors were in the Netherlands. Okay, but here this is more evidence of the the history of the Moors, but we see how they are being dehumanized and how they're being made fun of. Okay, read this article here. Um, center class and Joie de Piet. Why a holiday has me talking to my kids about blackface. This is just a, a brief sample of the type of information we deal with in the class. When we go through our history. There's a timeline of history that uh, we look at as well. Uh, there's over 200 slides uh, in the class, but we look at... Um, Okay, yeah, we look at evidence that the uh, so we we do a Columbus also because uh, Columbus is central to understanding the spread of uh, slavery and in uh, laying the foundation for slavery, racism, capitalism, and exploitation of indigenous people, things like this. So uh, Columbus greatly helps uh, all that spread. But some of the things we uh, deal with in the class also, we do what is the transatlantic slave trade? What were some of the events that led up to the transatlantic slave trade starting? So we look at it chronologically. And because um, you can't start in 1441 with the Portuguese going into Mauritania, you have to deal with thousands of years of history and deal with what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. We, we look at Columbus and where he went on his four voyages, okay, and uh, areas that he conquered like Jamaica. And Hispaniola, and on the island of Hispaniola, you have Haiti or Haiti. Uh, uh, other islands like Puerto Rico, those islands, those island nations have never recovered for, from what Columbus and Spain did to them over 500 years ago. They have never recovered from that. When did Africans first come to the U.S. as slaves? Because even before 1619, the Spanish were taking Africans into the territory we call South Carolina, 1526. That's 93 years before 1619. That's usually not even talked about, even though this was our land stolen from us. And the African people were here in this land going back at least 51,700 years ago. And Dr. David M. Hotel's book lays this out. We, we were in this land before Native Americans even came here. So even though the transatlantic slave trade did happen, you have to study thousands of years of history that lead up to it taking place. Because there, you know, because there were we had already circumnavigated the globe many times, and their voyages were making back and forth from Africa to this land. Um, so these are just a few other things that we deal with um, in the class. Okay, all right. So you can register for this class at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Uh, also, I posted the link here as well. Uh, this is ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. The class is going to blow you away. And then, so I teach that on Saturdays, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Then on Sundays, uh, I teach from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement of Black Power, 1865 to 1968. Also, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. The second class largely picks up where the first class leaves off. So the second class, we start in 1803 with the Louisiana Purchase and the Haitian Revolution because those two are connected. The Haitian Revolution helps the Louisiana Purchase take place, and the U.S. gets 828,000 square miles of land for less than three cents an acre. They get it for about $15 million from um, France, Okay. And France steals the land from Native Americans and African people who are here. But uh, so then we go through and look at history leading up to the Civil War. And then we go from the Civil War to Reconstruction, uh, 1865, 1877, Jim Crow era, 
uh, World War One, Great Migration, 1915, 1970, World War II, Civil Rights Movement, the Black Power Movement. To understand what happened to us, what happened to us after slavery ended, and to understand uh, the laws and policies put in place, how we got into this predicament that we're in now, understand where we need to go from here. And we and we get to see the voter suppression tactics, the voter suppression laws that are put into the state constitutions after Reconstruction ends. They rewrite the state constitutions, okay, to impose poll taxes and literacy tests to suppress the African-American vote. Uh, even in states that had a majority African-American population like Mississippi and South Carolina. And during Reconstruction, uh, the majority of the um, state legislatures, majority of the members of the state legislatures in South Carolina were African-American men during Reconstruction. And they're going to take back control of these um, state governments rewrite the state constitutions, impose poll taxes and literacy tests to suppress our vote, and then we get we get knocked out of these elected uh, offices. This is why you needed a 1965 Voting Rights Act to, to, to counter and nullify what the states were doing, imposing poll taxes, literacy tests, in some cases, uh, property uh, requirements, property ownership requirements, things like this. Okay. But we do with the Mexican American War, 1846, 1848, which leads to the Compromise of 1850. And the U.S. gets uh, California, Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, Utah, and Nevada. They get that territory from the Mexican American War in the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo of 1848, which ends the Mexican American War. This leads to what's known as the Missouri Compromise of 1850. I'm sorry, this leads to Missouri Compromise of 1820. That deals with Louis, that deals with organizing the land that the U.S. gets from the Louisiana Purchase. Missouri Compromise of 1820. Compromise of 1850 consists of five bills, and it deals with organizing the land that the U.S. gets from Mexico as a result of the Mexican-American War. And one of those bills was the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850. Okay, the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850. Uh, and then we deal with things like the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854. The, these are all things that lead to the Civil War exploding six weeks, uh, uh, um, the year after Lincoln becomes president-elect. Lincoln is the presidential candidate of the new uh, political party, the Republican Party, founded in 1854 as a backlash to the Kansas Nebraska Act of 1854. And we see with uh, uh, the Kansas Nebraska Act, what this does is this leads it up to people living in the Kansas Nebraska territory to determine whether or not they want to have slavery, okay, which is known as uh, proper popular sovereignty, whether or not they want to have slavery as opposed to it being dictated to them by the federal government, okay? And, th and this is going to lead to uh, armed conflict between pro-slavery and anti-slavery groups in the Kansas Territory that's known as Bleeding Kansas from like about 1855 to 1859, the, the Bleeding Kansas conflict, all right? Uh, and, then you, and then you're going to have um, presidential election uh, November 6, 1860. Lincoln becomes president-elect and Six weeks after that, December 20th, 1860, South Carolina secedes from the Union because they fear Lincoln's going to free the slaves. Because the Republican Party was formed by groups of abolitionists to be the counter to the Democratic Party at the time. Okay, you had the Democratic Party, and you had the Whig Party that was dying out by 1854. The Whig Party was dying out. Um, and then we see the following year. Uh, by February, you're going to see about six other states secede from the Union. Then that April, we're going to see the Civil War explode. OK, so we deal with the Civil War, 1861, 1865. We deal with special field order number 15, 40 acres and a mule, uh, general order number three, uh, which deals with Juneteenth. Um, we deal with Reconstruction, which is not really taught in schools at all. Reconstruction, 1860, uh, 1865 to 1877, due to the 13th, 14th, 15th amendments, those um, uh, constitutional amendments uh, 
those uh, reconstruction amendments. We deal with things like the uh, in the the four force acts, the force acts, including the third of the force acts of 1871, the Ku Klux Klan Act of 1871. All right. So we do a reconstruction. Then the presidential election of 1876, Rutherford B. Hayes versus Samuel J. Tilden. We deal with the Compromise of 1877, which ends Reconstruction. Then we deal with the Jim Crow eras and see how the rights that African Americans had were being reversed and segregation is being reimposed, is being imposed. And we see the changes in the state legislature, changes in the state legislatures that are taking place, starting with uh, Tennessee, uh, 1881, passing laws to uh, segregate uh, public transportation. Then we see uh, Florida imposing the first poll taxes in 1889, 1890, Mississippi State uh, Convention, where they rewrite the state constitution to impose poll taxes and literacy tests. And then that becomes known as the Mississippi Plan, which gets adopted by other Southern states to do the same thing. Just like they're doing now, Republicans are doing now in different state legislatures as a backlash to uh, African Americans coming out and voting and voting for Joe Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris and voting for Senator Raphael Warnock in Georgia and Senator John uh, and Senator uh, Ossoff uh, in, in Georgia. OK, and Republicans are passing these voter suppression laws based upon the big line as a backlash attacking the African-American vote. Well, we saw the same thing happen in the 1890s, early 1900s in these state legislatures, especially in these Southern states. We see the same thing taking place, targeting African-Americans. And we're gonna see uh, political violence, okay? We're gonna see domestic terrorism inflicted upon us to keep us from voting, okay? Like the, like the Yafala, uh, Alabama, uh, uh, a massacre in 1874 or the Vicksburg massacre, 1874, Mississippi, Colfax massacre, 1873. We're going to see political violence inflicted upon us, just like the January 6th insurrection, January 6th, 2021, which is political violence to interrupt a constitutionally mandated uh, uh, process to uh, certify the electoral college votes. They're using political violence to interrupt a political process. They were using political violence to attack us and attack white Republicans as well to keep us from voting. All right, so the, the, this is just a, a, a brief, brief overview of the content that I deal with in these two classes, Ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school, and um, from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968. So you visit, you can visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Also, here's the link to the bundle pack. The bundle's on sale, $100, regularly $260. That registers, registers you for both classes. We do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived and recorded. You can watch it many times. So as soon as you register this content, you can already start watching. You can watch the classes that we did um, this past weekend. And you can join us in classes coming weekend. All right. We have to get out of here. Remember at the African History Network. Oh, also, uh, email me at ahnshow at africanhistorynetwork.com if you have any questions. And if you've taken any, any of my classes in the past, you can register for these for 50% off. ahnshow at africanhistorynetwork.com. All right, we have to get out of here. Remember, at the African History Network, we, fo we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world. Because right now, it's correct your own behavior. It's not over till we win. We're kind of forever. And uh, we'll talk to you tomorrow. Peace.